How are you? <laughs> uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me here. Hi, Sue. Yeah, um, oh, just a little pre-warning. Um, I, there's some parts of the book that are explicit. I just want to make sure you're okay. Because, and I won't read the story about what I was going to read, which I really am uncomfortable <laughs> reading <laughs> around um, one too small. But um, I'll, I'll find other things to read, which is fine. How old are you, my dear? Nine? My baby's seven. I have another one who's 16. So I'll try to keep it um, in the right place for you. Yeah. <laughs> I think my 15-year-old's older than me sometimes. <laughs> All right, um, this book, Split Tooth, uh, it was a little bit of a shock to, to have anything published because I, I, it was basically my diary and a diary of ideas that I had. Uh, from my early childhood all the way up into my 40s. So when uh, I never considered myself an author, and I suppose maybe that's the number one thing I would say. Uh, I was never trained in writing or never trained in music, and I think that we should never um, put ourselves in boxes. We should never think we are not good enough to do what we feel we can do. And then um, I'm also very thankful for people who do a lot of training and a lot to be experts. <laughs> um, I'm just getting used to doing uh, these readings. It's really easy for me to do concerts because I can just get up on stage and scream and not use, lyri uh, not use any lyrics. The interesting thing about the book is that it's the, the opposite. It's just my brain and uh, not, not so much my feelings. So I think that's why it was scary and why it can be scary. So uh, I don't know if people are familiar with my work or not. Oh, it's hot up here. Um, I don't know who's familiar with my work, but I'm from the very, very, very high Arctic. Excuse me. Uh, up in the top of Canada. My mother uh, was born and raised in an igloo. We're uh, from so high in the Arctic. And then uh, the government wanted to take hold of the land and mineral rights of the Northwest Passage. So the Inuit were forced into communities. That happened by... Um, slicing up our kayaks, killing our sled dogs, giving us identification numbers, and ensuring that we were declared Canadian citizens just for money. And as we watch this entire world decline, our environment decline, and our spirits and health decline for money, I just hope that by the end of this, we have a little bit of clarity in the beauty of our humanity and how lucky we are to be sitting here side by side with our bodies together and how we can work together to try to leave a better earth for our children and to teach each other how to respect each other once again because we've forgotten how to respect our planet. Um, this is all very crucial to me and one thing I'm noticing from touring to these 38 countries is that there are always, there's always beauty in the people that we meet and love, and that we can get sick from focusing too much on um, the news or your president. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I just hope that uh, we can find a better way. So because my mother was born in such a place and I grew up in Nunavut, which is this vast land 
of 90 million square kilometers with less than 50,000 people scattered across it, I am very familiar with my land, or well, not mine, the land. Um, it's a little bit of an opposite be belief where I, I belong to the land, the land doesn't belong to me. And uh, we're still so isolated that outside of our tiny communities, we don't even need permission to build a cabin or permission to be on the land. And um, if you get a chance to read, read the book, there's um, some indication of that, of the 24-hour darkness and the 24-hour sun. In the summertime, we have three months of 24-hour sun around the solstice. And that's an incredible time for many things. Um, the, the permafrost is, is, going a little, is melting a little more every year. Things are changing around the way the animals migrate. And, and then in the wintertime, we have three months of 24-hour darkness. And that's also a very magical time um, because it's the time of, of silence, and it's the time where the cold feels like it wants to stop the warm in you. It's you have to protect yourself from the cold. And uh, I just wish that I could give everyone a little piece of what it feels like to live there and be there, and the resilience of Inuit and who we are and how we live, and because because the summer is so short and the Arctic sea ice sometimes is over 10 feet thick in the winter time, there's no vegetation. So our land, um, everything we live, our clothing, it all came from animals. And we have a very close relationship with animals and uh, don't consider ourselves above them. Right? In, in fact, it, it can, we can find some of them more important than us. So, living and traveling around this world with all, all the different cultures and all the different ideas, hopefully before I die I can siphon a little bit of the knowledge that m my mother and my grandmothers have given me and share it enough and glean ideas from you and knowledge from you too. Um, anyway, I'm going to read some of my book <laughs> and I'm going to keep it to 9 slash 40 as much as I can. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure we can figure that out. Okay. Huh. All right. <clears throat> Smells unleashed from the spring thaw lift us into a frenzied desperation for movement. The air is so clean you can smell the difference between smooth rock and jagged. You can smell water running over shale. Lichen smells sweet. The green lichen smells different from black. In the spring you smell last fall's death and this year's growth as the elder lichen shows the young how to grow. The freeze traps life and stops time. The thaw releases it. We can smell the footprints of last fall and the new decomposition of all who perished in the grips of winter. Global warming will release the deeper smells and coax stories out of the permafrost. Who knows what memories lie deep in the ice? Who knows what curses? Earth's whispers released back into the atmosphere can only wreak havoc. Sprigs of green begin to push their shy lives through the ice blanket. The songs of migratory birds are like alarms that waken us from the topor of winter. Life has arrived. The ice begrudgingly recedes, promising vengeance in a few short weeks. 
Winter always wins. The sun scoffs. Nothing can stop the cacophony of gluttony and procreation about to ensue. The sea ice is still strong, but the ponds have melted and are now open. The mosquito larvae swirl in their figure eights, hypnotizing and beautiful. A stark contrast to what they will be in a few days when their metamorphosis turns them into the cyclone of bloodthirst. I'm certain that if I ever had the opportunity to torture an enemy, they would find themselves naked on the tundra in mosquito season with their hands tied behind their back. As children in spring, we have the run of the town. Just as we have grown weary of our parents' company, they have been tolerating our frenetic housebound antics for half a year. The 24-hour sun is feeding our visions and keeping us warm. We run the dusty streets looking for adventure. Large gangs of kids and large packs of loose dogs roam the town. I wonder which group is more rabid. None of my friends have curfew, but I do. We must get our adventure done before 11. We leave town and come upon a smallish pond. It's about 50 meters long, half as wide. There are blue styrofoam pieces lying around, wind blown from construction sites from the last building season. We decide to play hero and use the flimsy pieces of styrofoam as boats. Considerations like the high winds, the near zero temperature, and the depth of the pond are carried away like bits of styrofoam. These things never occur to 11-year-olds. No one knows how to swim. We take turns paddling out with sticks as paddles, our little bodies balancing precariously on our wobbling blue vessels. The wind picks up. One of us inevitably gets blown out too far. His makeshift paddle grossly inadequate to get him back to shore. He is the smallest of the group. He always was. Meek, quiet, and always smiling. No wolves picked on him because he was so good-natured. He was the prettiest of the boys, and the girls carried either a maternal instinct or a quiet crush on him. We kissed once, his mouth small and soft, his tongue slow. The wind pushes him out deeper. If he falls in, he will drown. Everyone knows this. Nobody speaks. We let the wind do the howling as his little face grows worried. He is in the middle of the pond now. His thin windbreaker is flapping up against him, revealing protruding ribs and a slight shiver. I can see his slightness, sense his vulnerability. The only sound is the wind and the flapping fabric of our clothing. His face becomes perfectly calm, more calm than normal. He looks like a serene old man. He looks like everything is all right. The wind gusts and the styrofoam tips to one side and then the other, but his body knows what to do. I see him take a deep breath and his breath steadies his ride. He's close to the far side now. I see his hands shake as he dips his stick back into the water. He's safe. He's reached the other side. His eyes look more grown up. We have witnessed him become a man. We all cheer. It's past 11. I rush home. We made it our styrofoam game. The next week, seven kids drowned in a larger pond close to the airport after using a water tank cut in half as a boat. We never played our styrofoam game again. Um, 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 um.
negotiation of what to buy, we, we left with two giant plastic bags of junk food. Cokes, M&Ms, salt and vinegar potato chips, the weird pink popcorn with an elephant on the package, Popeye cigarettes, and even a few real cigarettes. We lit the cigarettes behind the old A-frame house near the playground hoping that our mothers would not see us. We had already been caught smoking under the porch while eating a bottle of Flintstones vitamins earlier that summer. Nobody was happy with us on that day. I was aware of being the bad influence, but I could never keep you from following me from place to place. Sometimes I would trick you and run away and then feel bad and come back your little tear-stained face making me feel like I had no soul. I never let you tag, tag along while hanging out with the big boys because we were always up to no good. You were too small for all of that chaos. I did my best to protect you. I still do. It was getting late, but it didn't matter. The 24-hour sun was blazing high in the sky, and the cold wind kept us alert. Three months of bright light meant that there was no curfew, no time constraints. We wanted an adventure, which usually meant a hike out of town. There were a few interesting places we could go on our trek, considering the vastness of the tundra. The river was relatively close, where we would balance a two by four between the jagged rocks of the rapid and cross, praying our makeshift bridge would not falter. We could go to the beach. The shore was ripe with seaweed and their treasures. Remember that time we found a sea snake, its bloated corpse so cold and lonely? 
The playground was all right, but inevitably one particular gas-sniffing jerk would come along and pester us. Best to get out of town. We, mo we marched out on our own, feeling like big girls, teenage girls. You trailed behind on your tiny legs. We headed for Signal Hill. Making it to the transmission tower was good, but I wanted the cliffs. It was a steep climb and our breath was heavy when we reached the top. We ate half our food as we sat on the summit our feet dangling over the precipice as we kept our eye out for polar bears. My uncle used to slide down this hill in the winter. I remember thinking that he was the coolest and hoped that I would be brave enough to take risks like him when I grew up. We decided to try to make it to Nine Mile Lake. It seemed like just a few kilometers from the top of the hill. This is when I learned that on the tundra, Everything is much farther than it seems. The treeless expanse lends itself to illusion. We could handle it. The most daunting task was passing the seagulls' nests. There was no going around them. We had to run through their nesting zone. Courage does not come easily, and we run as quickly as possible. Your little hand in mine. Seagulls scream and dive when you get near their nests. I held my fist up to the sky and waved it as we ran so they would go for the highest point of contact. I could feel their beaks pecking through my thin glove. We ran as quickly as we could, even losing a few bags of chips from our precious rations. We were red-faced and laughing when we made it through. I will never forget your sweet little face that day, proud and exhilarated with her accomplishment. I carried your heart in mine. I still do. The tundra is sparse, rocky, no trees and hardly any dirt. The lichen takes hundreds of years to grow. They grow and die and eventually collect to make up the soil. We were surrounded by shale rock, dry and sharp under the feet. The clean and hollow crackle of walking on shale is still one of my favorite sounds. We lifted a piece of plywood and found a snow bunting's nest under it. Three bald baby birds screamed at us. They were so small, newly hatched. The veins under their still closed eyelids were purple and throbbing their necks barely strong enough to hold up their heads. Shrill cries filled the air, and a panic arose. We wanted to make them happy. Were they hungry? We opened up the elephant popcorn. We fed the little mouths. In horror, we watched as each one of them choked on the popcorn and died. We could see the kernels through their little transparent throats. There was nothing we could do. The mother came back from her insect hunt and made us cry even harder. We left in defeat, feeling like demons and hoping neither of us would speak of it again. I made the biggest mistakes with you. I still do. Finally arriving at Nine Mile Lake, we were thankful that the wind had died down a bit. We were relieved because polar bears can't smell you as easily. The water was vast and clean. Thirst is easily quenched by fresh Arctic water. Around the periphery of the lake, there were small ponds that held baby trout. I trapped one and put it in my mouth. I let it swim down my esophagus. Its tail tickled all the way down to my tummy. It was delightful. The flesh was so fresh. Something awoke in me, an old memory, an ancient memory of eating live flesh. It is a true joining of flesh to flesh. My spine straightened. When flesh is eaten live, you glean the spirit with the energy. That's why wild predators are so strong. 
The farther away you get from the time of death, the less energy meat carries. We pretended to be seagulls, not even chewing the fish and feeling them swim down our throats. We gorged ourselves on them. The energy of the fish's life was readily absorbed into my body, and its death throes became a shining and swimming beacon into the sky. If we acted like seagulls, then perhaps we could transform into them, screaming and soaring. We would fly home. Um. <sighs> Something is lurking. Something sideways, something hollow, something pasty and shallow, something jittery, something slow, sucking on mud and filled with woe. Something is stirring, something full, something thick and cold, something imperceptible, something unseen. Something war driven, something obscene. It makes me want to hide in blankets and make bad choices. It makes me want to destroy what's in front of me. It can only be freed with tears. <laughs> I show you my teeth picked up off the floor. Split tooth, growl tooth, dead tooth. I'll never mind. 
This tapestry has not been woven by accident. Silk and deception. Falsehoods twisted into each fiber. The blue water lost to a sea of red. Red tide. Poisonous intent disguised by the shine of the thread. When we weave, we weave past longing, past glory, past greed. Weave the hunger, weave the need to conquer, to vanquish, to quell with quill, with seed. We plant ideas with bullets, we heed, we raise fists, we draw fine lines to hold each other up against the ships. Sails, canvas, story, story, silk, survival is the only guide. We weave our own sinew, make a net to catch those not yet dead, those drowning on dry land. We will harvest the truth. We will collect the rent. This tapestry is being rewoven. this year. It usually happens in a four to seven year cycle, all dictated by the rains and melt. Plenty of rain means that the lemmings and their young are forced above ground, where there are easy prey for the fox pups. If too many foxes survive, there won't be enough food for them when winter comes along. They populate the dump and all garbage cans in town are full of them. I once saw five foxes in one rusted garbage can. Some become rabid, and then all of the children need to walk to school carrying a stick, preferably with a nail in it. All of the houses in Nunavut must be built on stilts because the permafrost makes it impossible to sink foundations. The space under the house makes a perfect hiding place for foxes. Foxes are such steadfast and mysterious creatures. If a wolf and a lynx mated, perhaps their love child would be fox, who seems to embody the uncanny agility and size of a cat, coupled with the strength and durability of a canine. 
My friend Eugene had to get rabies shots in his tummy after being bitten. It did not look pleasant. I was proud of him for not crying. Let's avoid rabies. My father and I go out with a handgun to kill some foxes. Satisfying dry cracks and snaps of sound as this gun goes off. I feel like a hero for an instant, saving the foxes from a slow death of starvation. My father is strong, self-assured. I hope that someday this fortitude emerges in my fragile psyche. The foxes run, the foxes die. I mourn them, but I understand that there is danger in mourning for those who would not mourn for you in return. Empathy is for those who can afford it. Empathy is for the privileged. Empathy is not for nature. Our family had dogs that would have to be buried or put out of their misery. My father always took care of his work, even if it was mercy killing our family pets. He did it without allowing room for regret. He just did it, like how we are all born, like how we will all die. No choice, only action. These foxes will die of starvation. Better to put them out of their misery. These foxes will harm school children. Better to put them out of their misery. These humans will destroy the earth. Better to put them out of their misery. Right now we are earth eaters, but I want to be a blood lover, an oil spewer, someone with a great wingspan, a spirit sipper, a flesh licker. I want it all. I kill a mountain of foxes in my dreams. Mercy killings but I do enjoy it. Speaking of tonight's dream, the sky is a kind of orange that only happens in the fall after the midnight sun begins to retreat. Rolling hills of sandstone rock look like pages of books, making it impossible to walk except for thin paths of spines or else you lose your balance. The path is guarded by sentries, hundred-foot-tall polar bears who are all facing south. I must pass them one by one. I'm terrified, but know it must be done. These are beasts of protection and warning. I'm thankful they remain still as I meekly seek passage through their domain. The sun is setting and the sky is crisscrossed with airplanes, each leaving plumes of thick gray sickness. None of the planes can fly past the line of centuries. One half of the sky lives while the other half dies. Dead skies. The centuries can only hold the balance for so long. We are the land, same molecules, same atoms, the land is our salvation. Save our souls. The land is our salvation. Breathe. Guya. Feel. Empathy is for those who can afford it. Ice will crack. Blood will flow. Sun in ice. Ice in lung. Speaker of tongues. There are so many ways to be empty. Ice in lung, flush of cheek, blood in mouth. Thank you. <laughs>